folks. How is everyone doing this evening? I do apologise, it's probably a bit of fan noise. Um, no easy way around that, really. I was thinking of switching over to a desktop at some point. I've got quite a good one here, although it might need a bit of an upgrade. But, um, yeah, I'm not kind of really set up for that yet. Um, that would be Linux anyhow, so um, I need to do some dry runs on that machine before uh, I'd be happy with whether it's going to be performance OBS. Chair start creaking again, which is annoying. So yeah, this mic picks up everything, it's very sensitive, incredibly so. Have my tea so I'm prepared. Now, uh, we might get some ups and downs on the stream, but the recording should be good if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, I'm still having some network problems with. Um, I'm not sure if it's a router or. I've kind of got a split network in the house, um, half of which I don't have much control over. Um, I'm going to run an experiment next week where I'll be able to completely disable that part to see if it makes any difference and isolate it. But um, we have to wait and see. So just bear with me if the frames drop, they normally come back. If it gets really bad, then obviously we'll have to stop, etc. But I'm hoping that we're all going to be good enough. Um, for this and certainly the YouTube recording will, um, will not suffer from the same same kind of dropouts that the live stream does. Um, when, when the dropouts occur they seem to be very temporary and then it comes back. Um, so fingers crossed. Hope everyone's doing well. Had a good few weeks. I don't think I've streamed for at least two weeks. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, I haven't turned the last few streams I've done into YouTube because we didn't actually achieve much in them. Um, either due to uh, streaming issues, recording mic issues, or amplifier and mixer issues, or just they just they they were just chatty chatty streams and not actually productive in any way um, that you probably wouldn't get much from unless you're actually there live. But my intention is to um, keep this one uh, and get it up on YouTube as well. So, fingers crossed, it will go smoothly. That's what will happen. And this morning, uh, sorry, this morning, God, it's been a long day already. Uh, this evening, my time, this morning for some people, I guess, um, we're going to focus on. Um, the latest MyStorm board that um, I'm just in the process of um, bringing to fruition, let's say. Um, that's actually called um, Logic Deck, or in fact, this is the ICE version of the Logic Deck, because I'm working on two versions of the Logic Deck. Um, but in, initially, um, the ice version is the one that I want to get out first because um, I almost said it was the easiest one to do. Foolishly, it's not easy, not by any stretch of imagination, believe me. Not in terms of designing and getting right pinouts and everything else. It's a complex business to optimize. But given the component shortages and everything else that's going on, uh, it's actually difficult getting anything out uh, into production. So, um, yeah, 
but this is the one with the uh, lower risk which is why I'm doing it first so um, we will move on to that shortly um, has any got, anyone else got anything to ask or whatever before I move on to that stuff please let me know I know people are arriving there given that I haven't done that many streams recently there's probably not going to be an awful lot of people live um, I think Laurie said he was going to join us which is good uh, and Laurie has some really good questions normally uh, and hopefully he's going to go through some of them that he was um, bringing up earlier so that we can cover all of our bases for everybody so everybody knows kind of what uh, what the logic decks are about and then I can talk more generally as well or we can go into detail and whatever whatever's uh, required I'm just going to set up my workspace so I'm ready to go with this. Um, and if you're watching, please uh, introduce yourself, let yourself know. Um, oh, what's this? I don't know if there's some strange people following me. I do wonder if they're actually people, some of these. They sound more like machines. Or scripts. Workbench, let me set up the cards. Here, so it's picking up the PCB. Let's see if I can get it to pick up the schematic as well. Now uh, it's picking up the PCB twice. Right. Let's just change this one. Oh, that's not really very helpful. Okay. Uh, I think about the size here. Um, just going to change the size of these windows so that they fit in a bit more. Otherwise, I end up just going off the edges half the time. Myself whilst I get this sorted. So it's a schematic and PCP layout. Let's have a quick look at that. I think it's probably going to be okay. And that size. centralized wow skittish okay um <coughs> excuse me it's probably very loud on the mic that's a bit unexpected let me just have some uh, refreshment I might stop me coughing Also, I'm doing more down on. Um, oh, what's this message? Get off. Down on Discord, so I should give you a link for that. Bear with me. Mm -hmm. uh, give you a link now for discord because that might be useful uh, it's great you can, you can use this during the stream if you if you use discord if not um, if you're looking at YouTube, please feel free to join us down on Discord. It's where we tend to um, get a bit deeper into discussions about things, and it's easy for people to ask questions as well, so it's kind of nice. And you'll find uh, several channels down there. 
Um, So that's useful if you want to extend the conversation or join some of the existing conversations there. We have a live stream channel down there and then we have more specific um, channels such as the Black Ice channel, Black Crab channel, Black Edge. Um, more recently I added a Logic Deck channel as well. So, um, where should we start? Let's start with probably worth doing a recap um, before I go into the details of um, logic deck I should remind folks that, um, that what we're working on here is a tile based project now what are tiles let me give you an example so um, this is a prototype for tiles. Let me see if I can get the camera to pick this up. That'd be nice. Uh, and this one was based on. Why isn't that focusing? Focus. I don't mind it. Come on, come on, there we go. I went back, I went back, I went back. So this is based on uh, ice core. So I've got the ice core on here. That's the kind of FPGA and STM32 that are powering this uh, tile carrier, if you can think of it. Carriers are the board that um, an ice core can plug in. So ice core here, this was the board that originally we used on the Black Ice MX. So when it's combined with Black Ice MX Carrier, it's called Black Ice Products. It's a two-board solution. So tiles, of which here there are one, two, three, four positions for tiles. Forget the top one. It's a spare space at the moment. Oh, hold on one second. I think my cat wants to come in. Yeah. Give me just one second. I'm not sure my cat's out. You are going to be soaked. Let me give you some biscuits. How are you getting to this? I would pick Twinks up normally. Say hello to you, folks. But in this case, she's dripping wet, so probably best not to. Um, so yes, this is a board which consists or can house four tiles. What's the tile? Well, if I look at this one here, this is a proto tile, and it's about 50 millimeters by 45 millimeters, and it uses a surface mount connector you can see underneath which is a 1.27 millimeter pitch uh, the tile part is male and the carrier part is female so on this carrier board there is four of these female 1.27 uh, mil pitch 50 pin connectors <laughs> and we use all 50 pins although 28 of those pins are really just for carrying the high power lines because the tile doesn't just provide um, mixed signals and digital signals, it actually provides um, high power signals. So this board will distribute the high power signals as well, which is great. So if you're doing kind of anything industrial or you're doing robotics or automation or that sort of thing, um, it has built in power distribution and potentially power management as well. So it's a bit more flexible. The reason I like this design and the reason I've gone for it is because of its me mechanical stability. If you've ever done uh, work with things like um, P-Mods, for example, 
Here's a Black Eyes Carrier MX. And I'm plugging in the extender here. One of the problems that you have is this. You see how loose that is? And this is quite a fresh one. Uh, the older they get, the looser they get. It's just mechanically not very good. Um, and when you start putting these things together, it just starts getting out of order very quickly. The bits hanging off, etc. It's just, from a mechanical point of view, it's a very poor solution. It's useful for quick, just checking things out, but it's not so good for uh, uh, physical solutions. That's the same for P mods as well as mixed mods. In fact, it's worse for P mods because there's actually less less connectors on it, so the uh, uh, mechanics of it are actually slightly worse. Um, tiles aim to solve that issue, among other things. Oh, you want to go through? Thanks. You want to say hello first? Here you go. It's one slightly wet cat. It's a bit quiet now, but you can probably hear the rumble before the rain on the uh, roof. It's actually fairly um, torrential out there. So, um, tiles are. In fact, I could probably show you what they're like. A single tile. So that you know what you're dealing with here. Uh, use, um, I've got some CAD for one here. Bear with me. This might help explain things. So if we look at the uh, photo tile, for example. That's what a proto tile looks like. So this end here, underneath, you can't see it, it's actually in the blue tabs, is the 50 pin SMT um, 1.27 mil pitch header. That is then exposes most of its connections on this first row of the prototype or patch patch place on the board. On the top here we've got a surface mount connector for a 0.1 inch dual row connector that exposes some of the things as well. That's good for testing if you want to plug in you know, your logic analyzer or something once you're going through. Um, and then at the other end there's a position that you can put a connector in and then you can patch in any components or whatever as a prototype. And then you have uh, voltages on the bottom so yeah, plus three volt free and ground, plus three volt free and ground on the top as well uh, on there. But that's you can see there is a tile, and that's 50 by 44 millimeters. Those are the dimensions of a tile. Um, so that's obviously a fairly simple prototype tile, just to give you an idea. Electrically, what they look like. Uh, um, Just show you quite simply. Um, turn off my layout there. So there is the schematic of the proto. Key thing here: this is what a tile looks like schematically, and it consists of um, twelve digital pins normally connected to the FPGA. I mean there's no reason you couldn't use tiles for uh, a microcontroller by the way um, and I've, I've thought about that as well but initially I've designed it for FPGAs. There's nothing stopping it being used for microcontrollers. There's nothing specific about the functionality that expects you know anything special on those digital IOs. You can think of them as general purpose IOs. Uh, however in our case um, these IOs, now you should be able to see it, sorry, I didn't flick it through, D0 to D, D, 
D11. It's 12 digital IOs, so capable of either input or in output. There's no, there is no, unlike a microcontroller, these are not pre-designated to any particular function. Um, because the, in, inside an FPGA, you can mux any function onto these. Uh, that's not strictly true on some FPGAs. You have special pins for things like memory controllers, or sorry, memory interfaces like DDR memory interfaces, etc. Um, one thing I've been trying to do is get the first eight of these as uh, mapped pairs as well. So the first eight of these on each tile are mapped pairs, um, which is also handy. But you can't guarantee that the four above that will be uh, pairs that normally just have a general input output. Now, in addition to the uh, IOs connected to the FPGA, you've got an I squared C connection that can be used for a number of things. It can be used for peripherals or it can be used for identification, for example, to say what the tile does. Um, then you've got a common reset signal and a common enable signal. In addition, you've got a TR signal. That's basically tile request signal. You can think of it like a, I, I need an attention or interrupt type pin, and that will go directly to the microcontroller in this case to say that this tile needs uh, attention. You've then got two, and, and there's one of those for each tile. That, that, that's unique. That's not common. And then the there are two pins which are mixed signal. So these can be analog or low bandwidth digital. And those are, in this case are connected to the STM32 microcontroller. And then there's a reserve pin. And then we have some um, IO pins. There's a five volt pin, which is useful if you want to provide uh, five volt power. And then there's VDD. Now VDD is normally three volt free, but I am le leaving open the possibility of that being a one volt eight. Um, although we're not doing it on the ICE logic deck, it may be possible on um, on on its uh, on its logic deck cousin. Um, it's a bit complicated how that works, and um, we might have to do more than one. But I, I'll come come to that later. You know. Um, as we get more established with the logic decks, uh, we're probably not going to cover much of that uh, in 2021. That's probably a 2022 thing. That's just a future feature. Um, and that's what a tile looks like electrically. And on the top here, you have two um, power uh, voltage supplies. Um, you have uh, plus V and minus V, and these can deliver much more power. Uh, if you're watching on the stream, by the way, you may notice that we've just had a little uh, um, disconnect. Hopefully, it will come back. Um, so, hopefully, we should be back now. What I was just saying, um, sorry, hi, hi, Laurie. I see that you're in the in the. Um, in the chat as well now in the stream chat i was just saying that on the top there we have the um plus and minus for the power sub you know power electronic side of things and that's distributed on the board and can deliver quite large currents in terms of voltages initially it's probably going to be about 20 volts uh, we may go higher later on or have options to go higher Okay, so that's that, that's tiles. So let's just now go back to um, the kind of things that we're going to put on tiles. Well, all the things that you can put on a P mod, obviously. But in addition, we can do other things like uh, make motor driver tiles, servo tiles. Uh, we'll probably be able to do brushless and brushed motor drivers, etc. Stepper drivers, all of those kind of things, actuators. Uh, we can even do isolated logic switches. We can do um, any number of kind of what you might consider power electronics type applications. You know, you could have a tile that distributes network signals, for example, and could easily do PoE. So you could have tiles that do different numbers of PoE channels, for example, and build yourself a router on this. 
I had a project a few years ago that distributed power over Ethernet. Um, that could easily have been made using this, this kind of layout uh, for a relatively small number of parts. Or you could do RS-485 distributed CAN, distributed CAN links as well uh, on a kind of hub, hub and spoke type design. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can do even more interesting and sophisticated things with these that you wouldn't be able to do quite as easily with something like PMOS. Now the other thing that you can do, again returning to this, is you know uh, one of the reasons that I'm calling it, you know, logic deck. Obviously the logic represents the FPGA and microcontroller in the centre of it, but also deck is you can think of it as consisting you know, of a main deck or a centre deck, if you like, or mid deck, and then upper decks created by, in this case, tiles. Um, and when, when we look at the uh, logic deck, we'll see um, something else called a mezzanine. So that's really where the uh, naming is coming from, uh, this idea of having a deck. It's very horizontal, very mechanically stable. Um, the other thing that you'll notice on here is we're screwing in um, each element using, in this case, PCP standoffs, but you can use screws, standoffs, any combination really. Um, so you've got good mechanical stability with that as well. But plus you've got this big horizontal surface. So it's really good if you want to put on things like um, LCD displays, you can attach cameras to the front and put modules together and create a kind of face here, uh, including buttons, cameras, screens, uh, you know, encoders, controls, knobs, that kind of thing. So you kind of, you can kind of build a face here on it. And we're going deeper to that kind of stuff, perhaps, when we start building the, uh, the first ones, you know, um, probably in November. Uh, my plan is to have uh, build one internally here in November and then another couple of others which I'm going to distribute to uh, a couple of other different people because we need to get it out there and test it, we need to shake it, see what breaks, test it um, and work out what is possible, what isn't, what works, what doesn't kind of thing. Um, we may just get a few frame drops and warning you now because I'm getting the warning signal from OBS. So let's go back to the CAD and let's take a look. What we'll probably do is a walkover of um, the ICE Logic Deck. It's probably the best place to start. Um, Oh, what's the best way of doing this? You had lots of really good questions earlier, Laurie. Why don't you go through and ask me the various different questions and then I can talk about the various different sections. Do you fancy doing that as a kind of interactive? I'm presuming you're still in the chat, Laurie. Um, a lot of this will end up um, probably on Discord as well. If you want to review it. Okay, so Laurie's um, suggesting that we start with the Hyper RAM and the Hyper Flash. Um, so if I zoom into that part, the interesting part here. See if we can cover that. So, if you look at these blocks here, I wonder if you can see my cursor. So, 
this, 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 and this are all part of the FPGA. So this is the power section of the uh, FPGA. Uh, and then we've got uh, the bottom, bot uh, the FPGA and this committee is broken into a power and SPI, and then it's broken into the various IO banks, uh, which is um, bottom here, right, top, and then left. Now, the interesting one from the point of view of the Hyper RAM and Hyper Flash or Hyperstar, let's say, uh, is the bottom bank because most of it's connected to the bottom bank. There is two exceptions. You need chip selects and those actually come here from the left bank. But these are at the lower left bank adjacent to the, um, adjacent to the top. Sorry, adjacent to the bottom bank. So let's zoom in here. So, um, on the left here, we have a um, 64 megabit um, hyper RAM, which is an 8 megabyte hyper RAM. And we have a 128 megabit hyper flash. Um, the advantage of hyper RAM over something like, for example, um, SPI RAM or PS RAM or or flash is really performance and the performance um, of hyper rams that you buy varies in itself we're using kind of first gen stuff here uh, reason being primarily because it will fit within the top end of the performance bandwidth of the fpga that we're using so it's a good uh, good value solution it's good price performance for what we're matching it with in terms of the FPGA. The FPGA, by the way, is nice 40, uh, 4K HX. If you're using the open source tools, that of course gives you access to 8K, not 4K. So uh, that only has 16K internally in, in uh, memory blocks. So you need to add something substantial uh, externally in order to do more interesting things. So, for example, if you want to build a frame buffer or something, um, then you're going to need a lot more memory. Um, if you want to run more sophisticated programs, then more memory is great. If you want to do networking things, most definitely, you know, having a lot more RAM is a, is a very good thing to have. Um, that's if you're designing things like CPUs. It's really, really helpful to have lots of RAM. Uh, and if you're exploring and experimenting with different uh, CPU architectures, then uh, having quite a bit of RAM. So there's there's more RAM in here. There's four times as much RAM in here as we had, for example, compared to Black Ops MX, which only had two megabytes or 16 megabit of uh, of um, of RAM. Now Hyperflash has an 8-bit interface that means it has eight data lines into the FPGA to exchange the information that's to and from the the memory um, and then it has a few control lines it has a clock which is DQK in this diagram and DQR DQR is bi-directional line so what, what what it kind of acts like a little handshake um, because inside this hyper RAM is actually DDR memory there are times where it may not be available quite as quickly as other times so it needs to be able to signal that backwards and forwards um, so the transfer itself happens using what's called DDR which is double data rate uh, signaling or, me or memory accessing in this case so what's happening here on the bus is as well as providing the clock, uh, normally rather than just triggering on a single edge of the clock, say the positive rising edge of the clock to do a transfer, it can actually perform a transfer both on the positive edge of the clock and the negative edge of the clock. This will operate at about 100 megahertz, so that's where we're hoping to get it. Uh, we've been doing some experimentation, Laurie's been helping a lot on this uh, using a PMOD um, hyper RAM. 
um, that he got from uh, Esden's, um, I think from the US store, but I'm not sure, you can't, we're having problems getting from the European store in the UK at the moment because of the VAT changes, etc. So we're no longer in Europe. So uh, Laurie already had one, luckily. So Laurie's been doing some testing and he's been using uh, Sylvain's um, MemTest core, which has a HyperRAM driver. Um, which is optimized in this case for the uh, ICE 40 Ultra um, 5K, um, which isn't the same as the HX that we're using here. So, um, Sylvain did a lot of work with Laurie in order to try and optimize that as much as we could, but there were some limitations. Um, not just internal to the uh, HX, ICE HX series that weren't catered for. Uh, the optimization script that Sylvan wrote was based around um, only using certain uh, banks as well. So that, that, that was a bit of an issue when it came to optimizations. But Selman did help a lot in that. Um, and we did get something basic working, but we could only wind it up to about uh, 80 megahertz. Um, and there is a combination of things going on preventing that from getting any faster right now. Um, but that will be that will be much better uh, on the logic deck because we're not going over a, you know a long set of routed lines via several connectors. Like we were doing on the P mod, these are very close to the FPGA itself, and I'll, I'll show you how close. Okay, let me just quickly give you a view so that you can see physically how close these are. Um, so, if we look at the layout here, I'll zoom into the area where the FPGA is. Uh, the FPGA is on the top here, and it's a 121 ball uh, PGA, FPGA, uh, ball grid array. And then the uh, hyper RAM is here, and the hyper flash is below it here. So they're actually very close to the um, FPGA itself. Um, Laurie, I'm just picking up the chat. Laurie's saying that he got it um, the um, HyperRAM P mod from the European store before Brexit, so he didn't have the issues then. I think Esden's actually trying to sort out the VAT and stuff uh, now. I saw. Um, I think he said he wasn't doing his uh, stream because he was busy doing a bunch of things, and one of those things on his list, I think, was. Um, trying to sort out VAT, so I'm hoping that he'll be able to fix that so we can order from his European store. Um, uh, Laurie's answering an asking another question about this. Are, the, are there shared pins between the Hyper RAM and the Hyper Flash? Yes, they share almost all of the pins. The one pin that's different between them is the chip select. So if you can think of this in memory addressing, you know, the HyperRAM sits at one range of addresses and then the uh, uh, flash sits at another level of addresses, maybe above or below, depending how you memory map them. Um, so you wouldn't be accessing it as, them at the same time. Um, that's a benefit because it saves us lots of pins. Um, so if we were going to mix, say, SPI flash with HyperRAM, we wouldn't be able to do that because you need additional pins. So this is a very efficient way of combining the two. Not only that, um, although uh, SPI-based flash uh, tended to be considerably less pricey than hyperflash, because of the issues getting hold of certain larger flash chips I've found, that that price difference has actually shrunk quite dramatically. And I got some quite good deals on the um, hyperflash as well. So we're kind of getting the best of both worlds there. So we've got a slightly wider interface to the to the flash because it's 8-bit as opposed to you know just normal SPI or quad SPI at best. Um, particularly if you compare it to like Black Ice MX, which we were having to run before. 
Um, so that should give us better access to flash and to the hyper RAM. But I think uh, in terms of speed to the RAM, the hyper RAM, it should run at about 100 megahertz, we're estimating. We maybe don't overclock that slightly, but the hyper RAM itself is rated at 100 megahertz. That is effectively because it's double data rate on both edges of the clock is doing a transfer that tra translates into about 200 megabytes per second, uh, which is a pretty healthy transfer rate. Uh, and that's probably not inconceivable to get to. We may be to push slightly past that, um, looking at uh, the things that are out there and talking to Sivan, etc. Um, I spent quite a long time talking to Savan, and Savan offered to have a look through um, my schematics um, over the weekend because um, he knows the inside of these ice chips much better than anyone else I know, apart from perhaps maybe Gatecat or someone who's actually writing, who wrote the fuzzers for this stuff. So he has some very good experience. and. Um, by allowing him to have a look at this, um, he gave me a whole bunch of suggestions and improvements that I can make, which I've already put into place here. Um, one of the other things that we've added here, if you're really into the electronic side and high, higher speed digital, is um, although length matching is probably less important, 100 megahertz, you want to try and get the length similar. Um, but what was important and something that Sylvain stressed is matching the uh, the the uh, impedance of these um, what are effectively transmission lines, um, and these are about somewhere between 50 and 70 ohms, roughly. Um, can't say for sure unless we. Let, unless we went for like an impedance match PCB build, but given the normal kind of builds that we get, um, it, it's going to be roughly around that, that mark. So if you think about what the output is from the FPGA in terms of the output impedance, what you need to do, you, you see a difference between its output impedance and those transmission lines that are kind of in the 50, 60 or 70 ohm range. So what we do is we add some series resistors here. And what those do is they give us uh, an impedance match. Um, by having the impedance match there, uh, and in this case, I think we're using 22 ohm series resistors. What that does is that reduces the amount of reflection that you're going to see on these um, signal lines. So if you were to imagine, uh, you know, a kind of square wave. Um, let me get back under the camera like that. What happens with the reflection is you get like, it looks like an overshoot before it settles. Now that overshoot and settle is effectively shifting the edge if you're not careful or the settling of it to a logic value. And that can mess with your timing significantly. So, um, you know, Sylvan said, do put the um, series matching in. It does make a big difference. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we're going to get the benefit of that. So I've added that in. So that is the uh, the memory side of the equation here. So we've got a much more generous memory arrangement than we had on Black Ice MX, for example. Um, and we're kind of near the performance limits of the FPGA. So the suitability is right. We're getting good value for money. Uh, and I think it's a good you know pairing of you know component choices uh, to do this but we're also getting more memory uh, than we would have had before now we are paying more for this memory than we would for just raw sd ram for example but the big win here is you know whereas an sd ram is going to cost 40 of the gpio pins the hyper ram is only taking you know 11 or 12 pins it's a relatively small amount that leaves us more pins for the IOs and remember this is a, a tile board and we need those IOs so um, what do you think Lloyd does that cover the hyper RAM and hyper flash parts of the board 
Oh yeah, we should mention that. Yes. So uh, what what Laurie's saying here is hyper RAM latency is not as good as SD RAM. Um, so it's not as good if you're doing kind of retro applications. So if you're trying to build a retro console, this may not be any better than an SD RAM solution, for example. The main reason for those differences are there is some internal latencies with the DDR RAM inside the HyperFlash. But more is that you don't have a separate address bus here, so you're having to move the address bus data bytes before you can actually, you know, in setting the banks of the DDR before you can actually do the data transfers. When you come to bursting, you're getting a kind of similar performance that we would have got with the um, SD RAM, um, lower slightly because that was a 16 versus a, an 8 bit interface, but still very good performance. Um, so on the burst rates, they, they're pretty good. On the latencies, we are kind of getting hit slightly. Um, there's not really much we can do about that. Um, you know, the easiest way around those things is to use caches, etc. But in the retro, the retro side of things, that's you, you can't easily do that because you're trying to recreate something that didn't have caching. Okay, so what Laurie's suggesting now, he's asking about the communication between the STM32 and the FPGA. So let's um, look at that. So we stay on the um, the layout for the moment. So if I just zoom out a bit, so we've got the FPGA at the top here, we've got the Hyper RAM and Hyper Flash as I mentioned before, and then we've got the um, STM32 down here. Uh, this looks huge in comparison to the others, but that's primarily because they're BGA packages, um, so they're much smaller packages. Uh, whereas the STM32 is a TQFN100 from memory, I think it is. Um, the communication between the STM32 and the FPGA is using two or dual quad SPIs, which is effectively a, a kind of octo, a pseudo octo SPI. That sounds like a load of gibberish, doesn't it? But it gives us eight data lines between the FPGA and the STM32. The STM32 in this case is the master. So that enables it to transfer a byte, you know, when it's in SDR mode with every clock edge or clock cycle in SDR, but it can also operate in DDR as well, so it can do what we're doing in, in say, the HyperFlash. So we can do a DDR transfer from the STM32 to the FPGA. Now, the DDO transfer, remember, we'll use both edges on the clock. It will use the negative and the positive edges. That enables it uh, to do two transfers per clock pulse. Um, the speed of which depends which microcontroller we use, but on the Logic Deck using the F7730, which is the current plan, STM32, F730, that will go up to 80 megahertz DDR, or I think it's 100 megahertz or 108 megahertz SDR. But if you add the numbers up, probably the optimum is to use DDR at 80 because that gives you an effective clock rate of SDR of 160. So that gives us 160 uh, megabytes per second, which is a really nice high bandwidth between the FPGA and the STM32. And this is something that we didn't have on Black Ice MX. We did have a SPI link that would do uh, dual SPI, two lines between the two, and that would even do DDR. But at much lower speed. This is four times faster than that. Uh, and it's a lot easier to do the transfers as well. So that's quite important because what that means is um, we can hook the STM32 uh, directly via this uh, higher speed interface into any bus that we put inside the FPGA that connects the various components together. So for example, if we were using, say, a wishbone bus, um, the STM32 
could be master or it could be a slave. Um, you could have a multi-master bus if you wanted an inner core on the FPGA along with the STM32. That means that it can then transact with any of the items on any bus with inside that FPGA and it could do so fairly rapidly. And we haven't had that opportunity before with the previous designs. That enables us to take advantage of all the functions and the speed and performance that we're getting from the microcontroller, which is going to run in this case, it's an F7, uh, which has floating point, it has caches, etc., and it runs at a native 216 megahertz. So it's fairly nippy. Um, you know, if you're running a soft core, if you're using something like the VEX RISC, or if you're using, you know, something like. Um, the RV32, which I know Sylvain's using in his um, uh, systems design, then you normally down, I think with the ICE40, are, are you down at kind of 60 or 70 megahertz? Is that right, Laurie? I can't remember. Um, so considerably slower. Not only that, but when you're doing a soft core, you're running not only, not only are you running slower, you're actually burning off a lot more heat because FPGA soft cores don't run anywhere near as efficient as a hard core. So, it, so if you have a demanding application, for example, maybe you're processing video or doing something intensive like that, having a hard core that can go and interface with that bus is an added bonus because that can be working away doing its thing whilst the FPGA is doing its thing. The other thing, by going that route, if you want to go that route, and you, you're not forced into this, obviously, you can do soft core, power core, or you can do combinations of both. Uh, the other thing that it does is if you take the load off and run it on the hard core, the STM32, that actually frees up more resources for doing your I.O. stuff and your other tricks and things to speed things up as well. So it can actually provide a more efficient solution. Um, so that's also quite an interesting area for development uh, for those that want to, you know, see how far they can take this platform. Uh, Laurie saying, not sure what you what F max you can get on the various cores. Probably about 30 megahertz. Oh, okay. I thought it was a bit faster than that, but anyhow, there you go. So that's um, how the STM32. So the STM32 doesn't just program the FPGA, and I mean it does do that. It has that capability. In fact, it needs to do that. It can manage the FPGA, but it can also strike up very high bandwidth conversations with it. The other thing is, if that hyper memory, that hyper flash, and that hyper RAM are mapped onto the bus inside the FPGA the STM32 can directly access it. You can think of it as a kind of NUMA kind of architecture, if you like, where you have the STM32 address mapping all of the peripherals inside the FPGA, including the memory and the flash as well. That's kind of useful um, because you can consider it sharing that memory space or partitioning it however you want to. Uh, Laurie says, depends what the core is doing, minimal one might be a bit faster. Okay, but anyhow, it gives you an idea. Having the STM32 there isn't just for management um, and interfacing and control. It is actually part of the equation if you want to bring it in. You know, if you want to load in some, you know, harder core von, von Neumann processing, then uh, and offload it from the FPGA or your soft core, then it's there, ready to do it, and it has a high bandwidth connectivity that enables it to interact with the uh, peripherals on any bus that you create inside the FPGA. Um, so that covers the interconnect, Laurie. Was there some? Was there? Do I, do I need to cover anything else on the STM32 side, or do you want to go back to the FPGA side? What do you reckon? Or have you got any comments? Anything I missed? Time to sip the tea. I might need some more energy in a sec. Okay. So Laurie's suggesting I speak about the uh, the camera. In timing, by the way, I've 
uh, on the stream I'd like to get finished by 10 tonight roughly so we're about an hour in just under so we've probably got another hour to go but I, I just figured I'd give you a heads up on that let's see how it goes um, so Laurie's saying perhaps you could talk next about the camera and the LCD FPC connected so let's, let's zoom over to the um, Oh, the other thing I should mention is uh, I'm doing the same transmission line trick here, adding the uh, the, the extra in series resistors here to try and balance out that communications. I know it's only running at a, you know kind of 80 megahertz or 100 megahertz potentially with the right microcontroller on there, but it, it just helps keep those signals nice and clean. It does travel a little bit further on the communication with the STM32 than the Hyper RAM does. Or the interface with hyperlab so let's just cover the top so if we look at the top side of this let's we're, we're forgetting the tiles for a moment if we look at the central top side part of the logic that we have the io logic that we have on the ice 40 hx here is dedicated to this area here now this area here has dual or multi functionality um, if you look very carefully at these connectors, you'll see it's got two double P mods, okay, uh, which is 16 IO signals in P mod format. That enables you to plug in any kind of P mod that you might have. And that's useful for legacy purposes. It's useful if you've already got P mods that you want to use. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail with this because we've already done P mods. I wouldn't say we've done them to death, but we've covered them very extensively. If you remember the uh, Black Ice MX look, we have effectively three lots of double P mods on here. They're actually mixed mods, but mixed mods themselves are capable of being P mods. Okay. So we've got that capability built in. So if you've already got P mods, if you've invested in P mods, you can use them here as well. That's the important point. Um, so you've got PMOD expansion if you want. Alternatively, what you can use those IOs for here is using these FPC connectors. Now, if you look closely, there's one at the top here. That's on the underside of the board. That's what's in blue here. Because my blue layer here is the underside tracks and pads. So that connect the FPC connector there is for an LCD, like a SPI LCD. So the kind of things that you might connect to there might be one of these OLED LCDs or a small like 1.3 to 1.8, uh, you know, inch uh, IPS or whatever LCD. Um, normally they have controllers built built in. Um, Laurie's done some work on getting these operational on things like Black Ice MX before. Um, I'm trying to remember there are certain controllers out there ST7789, ILI94, 9341, and there was another one as well that I forget. Maybe Laurie can jog my menu. Anyhow, uh, we're going to be looking at a few of those that have FPC connectors, i.e., just the flex in an FPC 24 pin uh, size that just slot into here. Okay. And they slot into this area here underneath uh, you can then fold them over the top if you want um, we will probably source some of these and be able to provide them as a kit to go with it or you can use um, anything with the same kind of connectivity and there are lots of different ones out there you know go and have a look at the normal Asian stores and eBay and Amazon you'll, you'll, you'll find lots and lots of these and we can, if you're unsure whether something's going to work or not, again, you know, you can just um, come onto the Discord channel and have a chat with us, and we can look at the specs and work it out. So there's a way of plugging a display in nice and easily on this board that's kind of built in, and then the other pins enable us to use this uh, this this FPC connector, which again is a 24 pin FPC connector. But this one's sitting on top, and this is designed for those um, OVR compatible uh, cameras. So um, these are very popular 
on um, you see them used a lot on things like Arduinos and stuff like that as well. They have a kind of parallel rather than the high speed MIPI type interface. It's like the old parallel. I can't remember is it MIPI C? I can't remember what the the official name for it, but it's a kind of it's it's uh, normally eight bits for the data, and then you'll have a horizontal clock. Sorry, horizontal sync, vertical sync, and a pixel clock. And sometimes you have to provide a kind of process clock for it as well. So those are wired in a very standard way. And there are lots of different um, types of cameras that you can actually plug in here. And let me give you an example of some of the numbers that you may recognize. I think Laurie worked with the OV7670, and he's done some work, and he's had that working with things like uh, Black Ice MX um, and the ULX boards, etc. Um, but others I've seen, you can get autofocus versions that I think people are now starting to write drivers for. The, what are the numbers of those? Um, 2640 was another one, and 5640, I think, was one that has built in autofocus. This actually has a couple of the pins to provide power for a coil that can control the lens. And um, there's enough intelligence built in that it can control the lens to do an autofocus as well. So we're seeing drivers come through for that. So we'll probably be able to take that information from those drivers and stuff uh, and maybe support those as well. There's going to be a lot of work to do on bringing those in, but there's no reason why we can't use those as well. We'll probably, again, source some cameras that we know work with this and make them available as part of the kit. It's probably a good idea to get people started. And then there'll be lots of discussion uh, on how we get these working, you know, the newer models that we don't, haven't already tested, uh, how we get those uh, operational as well. But the point being is you've got a nice interface there already built in and you can buy the cameras. They're actually relatively low cost when you buy them just with the uh, FPC flex um, compared to having to buy them on a board so um, that's a nice benefit as well so we've got kind of camera and display built in to this facility as well um, oh Lois just saying Vex risk can do more than 90 megahertz on the ice 40 but that is not a practical system on a chip. Okay, yeah, VEX risk is pretty amazing, really. So, um, now the other thing I should point out here is if you look carefully in between here, there's a small 1.27 mil pitch connector here. In fact, there's four, four pins. I'm probably changing that to a five pin, but forget that for a moment. So this connector here is part of what I call a mezzanine connector at the top and then down below there's another connector here a horizontal one same same pitch but this has 10 pins I believe now that enables a card to go on top a mezzanine card I call it which is a mid kind of level card that goes over the processor and the FPGA and that will be useful for mounting things like an LCD screen and a camera and we might even be able to put buttons and things on that as well. Um, but it, it it has a small number of FPGA connections for things like the LCD screen. It doesn't have connections for the camera, but it has a slot in. So you connect the camera through the FPC connector through the slot on this board so it can sit on it. Um, I wonder uh, if I can show you what that might look like. It's just a neater way of putting these components together rather than having them flailing, flailing around. Let me just hold on. I was doing a little mock-up image with Laurie earlier. Uh, 
there we go you can imagine that sitting um, over the top there in the center and then the blue uh, the blue rectangle represents where maybe the stream would sit the little green um, slot is where the camera flex comes through and then the camera is sitting below it which is like the gray area and you can have debug connectors etc as well on there because we take the debug information up to the mezzanine board so that's what a mezzanine board might look like it's just a neat way of securing the um, LCD and the camera but the mezzanine board could actually be used for a whole bunch of different things or you could have different types of mezzanine boards um, so that's quite a, an interesting um, addition that we're playing with at the moment and trying to work out um, what we can do with that. I'm just going to turn that off again now. That's just one of the ideas we're playing around with. Um, so does that cover it Laurie on the um, the LCD and the, uh, the camera I covered the bases I did a refreshment my sure I don't think it's it raining now yeah? And how are we doing for time? 907, we're doing well. I think we're going to get around the board. This is good. Okay, so let's dive in a bit deeper. Uh, Laurie's suggesting we have a look about the um, the uh, USB connector. So let's dive down to the bottom here. Remember at the bottom here we've got the um, STM32 uh, controller and then we've got um, we've got the connection up to the mezzanine board here um, and then on either side of this we've got two USB C connectors that I'm currently fighting with um, if anyone's got any good recommendations for USB C connect connectors that are reasonably priced please let me know um, I'm having some issues with the ones that I'm currently looking at here and I might need to change them but anyhow so we've got two USB we've got one on the left left bottom and one on the right the right bottom the one on the left is a bit like uh, the lower one on the old ice core do you remember ice core um, On the ice core board for black ice, you had, if you look here at the connectors, let's see if I can get it focused. There we go. On here, this one at the bottom was where we used to plug in, and that would power the board, and you could then program the board and then communicate to the board using that port. So. The analogous port on ice, ice core and black ice is this one here on the uh, logic deck. So that's prime. The primary function of that is to enable you to both program, you know, the FPGA and the STM32, um, but it can also be used for communication. So, for example, there is, as usual. As was the same in all of the previous um, black ice boards there's a TX and RX connection excuse me between the ice 40 and the uh, STM 32 because the STM 32 can then run something like a CDC class device over USB it can then represent that serial port um, to a computer that you may plug in so a computer will see that as a serial device so that can be used as a normal serial device that you communicate with or you can use it for uploading um, 
uh, images for the FPGA, programs for the STM32, etc. So that's a um, regular speed USB uh, connector. It's a full speed, not a not a high speed. So it's 12 megabits per second, which is fine for your kind of UX, etc. So that is the purpose of this main USB connector here. We have a second USB connector that currently is wired into the STM32 because the STM32 uh, F730 has two USB ports. So we can optionally engage this uh, um, USB connector. For example, not on this board, but on uh, it, one of the cousin boards, that could even be used as a programming specific port. Um, you know, we could run something like DAP over it if we wanted to. And we could then separate, you know, the serial communication and the programming. Um, with the ICE 40, you don't necessarily need to do that. But if you're using, say, an ECP5, then you might want to talk to the JTAG of the ECP5, in which case having something like a DAP adaptation is a nice addition to be able to include. Now, we're ways away from being able to do that, but it is possible. So we could reserve the usage of that for that purpose. That's where that is at the moment. But in this particular design, it doesn't necessarily have that much use. Um, there is a possibility, and Laurie asked me this, he said, well, could we connect that to the FPGA so that it can be a separate FPGA USB? Uh, I apologize if we get some frame drops on the um, stream, guys. It's going up and down like a yo-yo at the moment. But, so that is not yet set. At the moment, I've got it connected to the STM32, but that is not concrete yet. Okay. We could, if we wanted to, connect it to the FPGA. However, doing that is actually a bit tricky because not only is it a long way from the FPGA, but also we don't actually have any spare pins. And the things to consider here is it would be really easy to do a nice tile on the FPGA that had USBs. And we could do, you know, more than one port for the FPGA. So we could have host ports, game ports, and another USB-C port, for example, on a tile. Um, but there is another function of this, uh, experimental, I should say, yet to be proved. Um, we have another chip on here, which is just here. And this is a basically a chip that enables us to do USB power delivery. So this chip speaks power delivery. And power delivery is frustratingly complicated, let's say, particularly in the case of USB-C. Now, USB-C itself is complicated, but the things that run over it are even more so. Um, and having a bit of silicon to help with that is a good idea. Not only that, but power delivery also uses some weird communication as well. Um, and this chip has the you know physical interface for that weird connectivity. So we can then, from the STM32, we can then do power delivery negotiation. We can also get all sorts of other information from the device, which is kind of handy. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm thinking that this is a good idea for the Logic Deck is, remember I talked about having that uh, extra power on the tiles? Well, yes, you can connect up a nice power supply, nice juicy power supply for your motor. But in a lot of cases, you don't actually need huge amounts of power. So for small robotics or automation type applications, 
or deck type applications you probably don't need that much you don't need like really high voltages and you don't need really high currents so i figured well what about using power delivery so if whatever the device is that you're plugging in um, usb-c power delivery is becoming more and more common um, i'll show you something in a minute actually that i bought recently that's very cool but we're seeing more and more of this in use and the prices have come down tremendously. There's all sorts of things you can buy and all sorts of PCs and laptops and things support power delivery. So what uh, USB power delivery enables you to do is deliver up to 20 volts at five amps. That's worst case, that's maximum case. A lot of things don't go up to the five amps. Many of them only go up to three amps. But it depends what you need. So what what happens is you can actually do this negotiation with the device supplying power over USB. And that's what that chip is helping us do. We can then deliver that power to the tiles around the board. So we've got automatic distribution, you know, of up to of 20 volt, you know, with three amps, for example, uh, which is more than enough for running a few smaller motors, etc. Or communication powerings so I thought it'd be really nice to kind of build that in rather than have that as an extra if you want to build in higher currents uh, and higher power devices then it's easy to add those in externally and we provide connectivity for that to make that easy anyhow but then it becomes an external peripheral okay but having it on power delivery over USB cable is kind of convenient so I figured we investigate using that that's the thinking here but again if if let me know your thoughts on this um, there are benefits to it but there are also costs because we're adding in more components yet more components on this board but I think it's quite a good idea so that's the other function you know whether this is driven by the STM32 for the normal USB full speed part or by the FPGA the additional thing is we have this power delivery okay that's quite important and that's a really nice feature i think i'm really looking forward to that because that means we can plug motors and stuff in and do that kind of testing straight out of the box without adding anything you know amazing let me just show you an example whilst i'm here actually this is My cabling sorted out here, but I don't want to do with losers. So this is a great example. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, you're familiar with these guys, um, but the uh, are they called Pine Pine Company or something? Anyhow, this is Pine Power, um, and this has. Um, all sorts of different USB variants and things on the front but most importantly if you look at this corner yeah, you should if it focuses be able to see there we go PD 65 watt over the top of that um, USB-C connector um, and you can buy like power, um, what do you call them, uh, little uh, power dongles and stuff. Uh, but that's quite good because that, that, that deals with proper USB-C negotiation. That's good for testing and stuff. But there are all sorts of different things you can buy as well, which make it an interesting cipher now i'm going to have to write all the firmware to make that work which is going to be fun okay so that's uh that's the usb stuff oh um Lori saying mention the sd card that's important because you can't easily see that one here so again if we revisit this and if we close in actually in the background here let me follow the outline of this kind of rectangle on the underside of the board that's an SD card socket slash holder so it will uh, accept an SD card which is quite useful 
that is connected to the STM32, um, which has the peripheral built in for SD or SDMMC. It's a nibble type interface, 4 bit interface, so it's a bit faster than SPI, for example. I can't remember what the clock rate is, uh, but it's quite nice. So if you want some, you know, longer term or larger storage, uh, larger but slower storage, then that's kind of built into the board as well. You can just add an SD card and then run a kind of um, basic fat file system or something on the STM32, which will read that. There's lots of different uh, occasions where you might want to use that. For example, if you're doing a kind of gaming thing, you can use it to load your... Uh, your, your your ROM images and that kind of stuff for the uh, for the games and things, but you can also use it for things like logging, data logging, and that kind of thing. And providing you can provide fonts and things like that for the display. There's all sorts of different application areas where you know if you want some capacity that's beyond you know the hyper flash, if you like, then um, you can get very you know reasonably sized flash. SD cards um, for very little money, so having that as a plug-in is a uh, is a useful thing to be able to, to be able to lean on for storage. Um, uh, the other thing we've got here, if we look a bit closer, is we've got that kind of uh, SparkFun Quick or Stemmer I2C connector. That's the one mil type because uh, we can fit that in quite nicely here. So there's lots of I2C peripherals that fit on things like stemmer, stemmer cables uh, from people like Adafruit, SparkFun and all sorts of other people. Those are kind of useful, you know, you could have a plug-in accelerometer if you wanted. You know, you may, may not want to take up an entire tile or mezzanine, you know, doing I2C peripheral like a gyro or, a, you know, uh, accelerometer or a IMU type device well having something like the stemmer connector makes that easy you can buy off the shelf stemmer uh, IMU board and plug that into your um, I squared C here so that's kind of handy connector um, and you could add all sorts of you know lower bandwidth peripherals that way which are quite handy you can kind of daisy chain them over I squared C so it's a nice little feature to have. Either side of this, you've got an RGB LED. Um, so if we look at the one on the left first, the one on the left here, uh, one of the uh, LEDs, the red one, is connected to the Dun pin. Now the Dun pin we've always connected to a red LED previously on the Ice Core and Black Ice range of boards because when you program the Ice 40, um, you, you you'll see the the red LED activate but if it has a failure if it doesn't like the image that you've um, provided to it for example because the image is corrupted or it's bad a bad image that doesn't make sense to it or maybe there's been an issue in transmission that hasn't been detected although there is CRCs to try and prevent that then um, that's a really good way of knowing that you've got that problem so the red LED light part of the RGB will go on and stay on after programming if that's the case otherwise it will normally just extinguish itself um, the other two colors on that that uh, LED are driven by the RX and TX lines in between the STM32 and the um, um, ICE, ICE 40 FPGA so those are useful for monitoring traffic between the two devices if you've not perhaps got a terminal connected and you want to see if there is traffic going between them or if you're having problems communicating with the UART for example it's kind of useful uh, if push comes to shove and you're not using the UART between the two you can even use them as status LEDs for example um, the other LED on the right hand side of the stemmer connector is um, one of the LEDs, I think the green LED is connected to power. So when the power comes on, that automatically goes green. The other two parts of the RGB, the red and the blue, are connected to the SD card detect. So it's, when you put the card in, the LED should come on, confirming that it knows it's connected. 
and then the other the other one is connected to the st command line so that may alternate you may see some flashing or slight changing of the color when things are being written to or read from the card for example so that's so these two leds kind of indicate um various states um Laurie's saying do you still have a debug header there was a debug header on here um this one but actually i'm taking that off uh, for a number of reasons it's not in a good place for a start the debug connections are actually on this 1.27 header and so they can go up to the mezzanine board which would could have a debug connector on it and I'm also doing something else so uh, one of the other ideas I'm playing with here is um, there are cutouts on this card if you look on this side I'll show you the cutout here you see where it's cut out the reason I'm cutting that out is when you're putting tiles on top if you have a tile that has connectors for example that may be slightly taller than the gap between the two surfaces of the tile deck and the mid plane deck which is about seven millimeter clearance um, some connectors need a bit more than that so by having the cutout here you can actually put connectors on them when they're at a down facing tile and some of them are down facing some of them are up facing depending on the functionality that you want uh, by having the cutout here it gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of the height but then I was also thinking, well, we're cutting out pieces of the PCB here. Could we use those cutout areas for something else? And this is purely theoretical at this point. Um, PCB houses are notoriously funny about when you do this. But one of the things I'm exploring is using that space to create something um, that can plug back into the board. So in this example here, um, what I've got is a cutout piece um that will have mouse bites if you don't know what mouse bites are these are very small parts of pcb that leave it connected to the main pcb but small enough for you to break by hand or with a small pair of pliers so you could actually break this piece out and this piece in this example is a debug uh adapter so this converts that lower mezzanine connector that you see here into standard jtag arm jtag headers okay so you've got a 14 pin standard arm jtag header here you've got the 20 pin right angled arm jtag header there and then you've got the 1.27 the newer 10 pin uh, higher pitch um, debug header here which is uh, compatible with the arm standard so you can break that out and then plonk that on top of this connector here for when you're debugging so that's one of the ideas that I'm experimenting with is can I put other PCB bits in here that break out? Um, that is purely an idea at this point. I've been thinking about it for some time, but I'm not sure if it works in practice yet. Don't get too fixed on the idea until I can actually prove that that works. Um, but it's another way of putting more functionality into the board. Um, and with these sorts of things, because they're kind of through hold stuff, it would be a self assembly, you know. So, if, I, I would assume if you would know what you were doing with this kind of stuff, so you'd be able to solder those kind of headers in. I'll probably have the surface mount compo components already fixed, but the uh, these headers could be provided with the kit, but you probably solder them yourself, and it may be an option that you get with the kit. Um, and there are other possibilities to use these spaces as well. Uh, so Laurie's asking, do you have any external RAM or flash connected to the STM32? Yeah, I should cover that. So if we look closely here at the STM32, top right is an SPI flash chip, which is connected over SPI. And that will be, I think it's um, a 16 megabit, 2 megabyte flash connected via SPI um, and that supplements you know the built-in flash on here which isn't very large 
so that's kind of useful so that can be used to do things like store the fpga image or several fpga images plus anything that this needs to store you know um it's quite generous size wise there's plenty that can fit in just to give you an idea i think we only had like a four megabit flash on the black ice nx although i can't remember exactly um so it's probably four times larger than that again another upgrade um Laurie's asked me to mention again the p mods at the top maybe you missed a bit earlier so if you're not using the lcd and the cam you can use the p mods at the top here plug in double p mods uh, do you want to have an example of a double p mod that's a mix mod double mix mod uh, the only difference between a mix mod and a p mod is it includes the six pins in between the double p mods in the center i don't think i have a um do i have a double p mod I don't think I do. I'm kind of assuming you know what a P mod is, so maybe I shouldn't make that assumption. I wonder if I've got any pictures. Hold on. Wow, it's tipping down outside again. I don't know if you guys can hear that on the mic. How is the audio, by the way? No one's actually giving me any feedback on it, so I'm assuming nothing bad is happening, but I'm not sure what the levels are and stuff. I didn't do my normal audio check. So whilst I'm looking for this, let me know. Uh, let's have a look, pictures. Do I have any PMOD pictures? I don't think I do have some wing. No, I don't have any handy. Maybe I can find one on Tinternet. Oh, I'm not going to open my browser at the moment because it's got loads of tabs and it will just use all my memory up. And I don't want to interfere with OBS. Surely there must be one here. All I can find is mixed mods. Oh, here's a really old one. Oh, well, this is funny. Oh, this is showing, yeah. Hmm. Crikey, it's huge. I <laughs> have to make it smaller. Bear with me. So this is a picture of uh, Black Ice MX with some P mods fitted in it. Uh, uh, so if you look at the um, the seven segment display on the top that's a double p mod 16 pins that's actually plugged into a mix mod slot the difference between a mix mod and a p mod is it has the extra pins in between here in the center at the top um, you can see the width of a p mod so if you look on the left hand side of this image there's a proto p mod that's just a double p mod um, and then you've got some single P mod breadboard adapters on the right hand side from way back. Give you an idea. Hope that helps. Laurie's saying the audio is fine. You can hear the fan a bit. Yeah, that's my laptop on the train. Um, okay, so 
Uh, wait a minute. Laurie's saying, what are those pins sticking out of the bottom? Are you talking about these ones? Here. Though that was uh, exposing the debug signals. SWD, SW clock, SW. Um, oh. And reset. We won't need that because of the other things that we've got. It's on there at the moment because I haven't decided whether this um, adapter is going to work or not. Um, so pretend that's not there, basically. Pretend that's not around. Right, what next? I think we've covered all the major components on here. We haven't really talked much about the tiles. But just so I can remind you where those are. Top left quadrant. Bottom left quadrant. Top right quadrant. And bottom right quadrant tiles. And they, they are just like these things just like those they fit into those 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 positions so they're raised above the mid plane if you like above the deck on the tile level deck it's a bit ship like or spaceship like even if you want to be more exciting about it what have I missed Nori He seems to think that I've covered the hardware. That's good. How are we doing for time? 9.37. We've still got some time left. Um, I don't want to go deep into software. Um, I guess I should mention it. Um, software and gateware. So, obviously, we want to support Verilog, as we have done with all of our products, and that will continue we will have Verilog drivers for pretty much everything. Um, in terms of the memory subsystem, we're going to lean heavily on uh, Silvao's uh, um, hyperram stuff, for example. Um, and we're also going to support NMyGen. Um, hopefully, we're going to be able to mix and match things like NMyGen and the Verilog. Um, you can do that to some lesser or greater extent. I'm going to bring in some other interesting ones that I've found. Um, more on that later. We can talk about those probably in the new year. Some really interesting stuff going on there. But, um, yeah, Laurie's saying we need something for Hyperflash. So, as I say, we're probably going to try and use reuse what Sylvan's done because he's really as far as I can see got the best solutions on that front uh, and I know he's going to be improving his stuff I'm also going to send him a board in November when we make some of these up uh, and he's going to test that part of it in particular I'm sure he's going to test other parts as well uh, knowing Sylvan um, I'm sure he's going to have some fun with this um, and if we've got issues he will definitely run them um, on the other side, on the STM32 side, what we did before, oh, um, Laurie's just reminded me we will need gateware for communication between STM32 and ICE40. We will. That's basically quad SPI stuff. Some of that is already there. I think Sylvan's also got some of that, but I need to look at that and see how well that performs as well. Uh, we need to double up so it's octo rather than just quad but um, uh, we'll take a look at that but yeah the um, in terms of the firmware running on the STM32 previously what we did was we used the um, STM32 uh, MX uh, software for generating the base house and then wrote software that would work with that on top but in separate files so if you look in the um, ice core um, repository you will see there's a whole bunch of STM stuff in there 
all their how libraries are what we're relying on um, to write our code obviously it's all open source etc um, and we're, we were leaning heavily on them originally it was written in C then later um, I wrote the next version in C++ um, or what I call C plus actually because it's not really C plus plus we're not using all the fancy features we're just using a bit of um, object orientation to conveniently combine parts of it um, a lot of that software I might do a quick port of that software so it runs on this board because it's not going to be too different in fact the core is the same as on the Black Ice MX. Uh, a lot of the peripherals are very similar as well. So I may play around with the existing firmware. But the other thing that I'm going to do, um, and if you've watched some of the um, streams from, I think it was the spring. I can't remember exactly when it was. We started on something called Black Crab. Now, Black Crab is the Rust version of the firmware um, for the new, new generation of these boards. Um, so basically what we're gonna do is, ha is extend what we've already written in Rust, you know, which was really just kind of fairly experimental then. We're gonna start building on that uh, and building on Black Crab using Rust to create the new firmware, which is gonna be the main firmware moving forward for the SDM 32s so um, basically we're going to be building on black that's that that's what the the number one firmware choice um, is going to be moving forward although as I say I may you know kind of forward to port the old MyStorm C software initially um, it's also useful to have something to compare to which is quite quite, quite good and if anyone wants to help me on the Rust side, please let me know. Because uh, for anyone that's seen me doing Rust um, in the Black Crab stuff, for example, they will know that I am not exactly a um, hyperspeed developer when it comes to that. So it's an interesting learning exercise at the same time. However, it will give us some interesting advantages some of that will probably you'll see early next year with some of the plans we've got um let me just check what i've got here laurie's saying will the i2c configuration of the camera be done from the stm32 no we i've actually wired in two of the pins um to dry the um the OBR, you know, 7640, whichever cam it is, they're actually connected to the FPGA. They're the same pins that are driving that uh, LED on the top of the board as well. So two of those pins are designated for either driving the LED or I squared C. You can actually do both, but not at the same time, obviously. Uh, Laurie's saying we'll also need gateway for the LCD screen. We will, and I'm sure that um, you're probably going to do some work on that, aren't you, Laurie? That's your bag, right? I mean, I can help out, but yeah. What will be interesting is obviously driving that LCD from the STM32 over the bus. That's going to be an interesting exercise where the FPGA can act as an accelerator. Or he's saying I expect so. Yeah. You may get some dropout by the way. I'm seeing some red flags on my uh, frames on my um, transfer rate. But yes. So um, on the software side, Black Crab will be the key pieces of code. Um, running on the STM32. And I'm going to try and put the libraries in to make it easy for you to be able to write your own Rust code that sits with that firmware as well. That's going to be an interesting exercise, including you know some libraries for the bus and stuff. 
and also for debugging and all the other things as well how we deal with that that's going to be interesting any other questions Lauren I could have a sip and try and up my tea's gone and I'm onto the water And it is still tipping down outside. I think it's making up for lost lost causes. Have we missed anything, Laurie? Or, or is there anything else on the software front you want to ask? Or gateway front? And everyone, start thinking about tiles. What tiles do you want on here? Let me give you some of the ideas I've already got that I'm working on. Obviously, we've got a proto tile. We've got a breadboard tile. I've already showed you that one. Ta da! Just kind of cool. Um, I've designed uh, a brushed motor tile that includes encoders, you know, motion encoders. Uh, Laurie's seen that. Um, I'm just converting that from 8 bit to 12 bit right now because we made the changes on the tiles. I've got a design for um, a free axis stepper motor tile, including all the end stops, uh, common UART, etc. Uh, Laurie's asking, did you ever do a single P mod tile? I did, and I can I can convert that from uh, an 8-bit to a 12-bit. I mean, it'll probably work without that conversion, but I'll, I'll, I, I need to fix it up for the changes. For those that don't know, originally the tiles were 8-bit, they're now 12-bit. So I've had to change a few of the tile designs. Um... I also want to do a HDMI tile, um, and that's going to be a better HDMI than we normally do. Um, I've got some stuff to experiment with that. Um, that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, probably do a, something like a retro tile that has maybe VGA on it. Maybe a gaming tile with gaming controllers. Um, what else do I have that I've already thought of? Hold on, I could write a list somewhere. Do, 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 do. I'll, I'm going to do a seven segment tile because those are always popular. Uh, and I've got most of the bits for those. Um, I'll probably do a Wi-Fi tile and for the Wi-Fi tile what I can do I mean you could put the Wi-Fi on the mezzanine level but if you put it on the tile the other thing that you can do is you can give it um, a high bandwidth you know octo spy type connection into the FPGA if you wanted so you could then map memory map so you could interface onto the um, internal bus into the FPGA from the um, ESP32 on the Wi-Fi using, you know, either Spy, Quad Spy, or Octo Spy, depending how fast you want to. So that might be kind of useful. Um, Put on a tile that's definitely on my list um, there's some others but they're just it's just gone out of my mind for now but I'm sure everyone can think of a good tile they'd like network tile one that I have in mind uh, high-speed USB tile is another possibility um, there's lots of things that you can do, basically. Um, what's Laurie saying? There is a shortage of buttons, so we will need tiles with buttons. 
Yeah, I mean, you could put buttons on the mezzanine if you want them control from the STM32. If you want them control from the FPGA, then obviously put them on tiles. Um, you may be able to combine those with something else on the tile, for example. So maybe you could combine that with the Wi-Fi tile, for example. That's a possibility. Buttons, keyboard interface, you know, LED drivers. You name it, they could easily be placed on something like a tile. Um, the number of IOs and stuff that we put into the tile enable us to have a very wide choice of peripherals. Very, very wide. It's amazing what you can do with that number of IOs. Um, you could even do a double tile, a dual tile that's twice as high that covers two tile slots if you needed like 24 IOs. Sorry, we may have some dropout, folks. It seems to be occurring more frequently now. I think the stream's reconnected now. Obviously, you guys on YouTube won't have this problem. But uh, there you go. Okay, so I think I've covered my bases. Um, any more questions? Let me sit back and have a little bit of a sip here. I've lost Laurie. Ah, time scales. Okay, so I'm just finishing this. I'm hoping to have the board layout finished. It's pretty much done. Uh, I've got a few bits left. Uh, I squared C to the tiles, reset and enable to the tiles. And then I've got the main power routing, but that's fairly easy. I know where that's all going to go. Um, I've got a bit of optimization to do on some of the IOs, but pretty much everything else is done. Um, so I'm hoping to have this finished by the end of the week. I might then review it over the weekend and perhaps then order it. And it will take several weeks for them to come. So I, I'm looking at doing uh, a build in early November. Um, that's the current scale. Um, I've still got some bits that I've got to source actually, but I, I, there's nothing that uh, important that's going to be difficult to source that I'm aware of. I've got all the difficult stuff, so um, I should be fine on that front. Um, I can't say when we'll have them quantities. What I'm probably going to do, so if, if I do initial build at the beginning of November, probably going to build maybe three boards, one for myself, and a couple of others. Laurie's probably going to test one. I'm going to get one out to Sylvan as well. I promise Sylvan. If anyone else um, is willing to do some serious testing, then you know, contact me. Let me know. I might be able to get another one done. Um, and then when it comes to you know, given that we then you know isolate any issues and fix them, I'd like to then get a certain number of these built. And I'm debating what that number is right now. Um, I'm thinking of maybe building something like 40 of them up um, initially um, for folks on a first come, first serve basis. You know, obviously, those that are more involved with the project early on will get them, uh, and people willing to do, you know some of the work to help build in some of the um, gateware, some of the HDL, maybe do some further development, you know, tile development, that kind of stuff. Um, if you want a more involved part, then, you know, you could probably join that um, initial build of 40 or whatever. And, and I hope to get those out, 
with any luck, um, either late November, early December. Uh, and then I'll, after that, I'll build more. That's kind of the plan. I know it's a bit um, unspecific at this point, but uh, until we get past the initial testing phases, uh, it's difficult to see the exact time scale, but that, that should give us an idea. Um, does that, that give you a better idea, Laurie, than everyone else? I think, otherwise, um, if there's no more questions, I'm probably going to call the stream for this evening. Especially given that it seems to be dropping more and more. The YouTube will be good. About drops. Okay, well, let's finish it off there. Thank you for joining me, Laurie, in particular, and being such a good uh, director around our logic deck, asking all the right kind of questions. Um, that's excellent. That really helps prompt me to cover all of the areas. Um, and everyone else that's uh, either watching on the live stream and those that are going to watch it later on, on YouTube. Um, thank you for your attention to this and I'll cover a bit more uh, how we're going to move forward on this for testing and stuff uh, on the next stream. So maybe we can do some tiles or something perhaps. The latest versions of those cover some of those. Um, but in the meantime, look after yourselves, folks, and um, I will see you soon. Ciao.